This is Jennifer Gonzalez, welcoming you to episode 75 of the Cult of Pedagogy podcast. In this episode, we're going to talk about how you can teach a 90 minute block class like a boss. read you portions of a letter written to a Charlotte, North Carolina newspaper in 2002 by a first-year math teacher, a man who was vehemently opposed to block scheduling. Quote, I am a first-year high school math teacher. My school operates on a block schedule, a concept I had never even heard of until I accepted this teaching position. My observations of block scheduling have been a shocking education for me. Block scheduling has resulted in less emphasis on core content and more on gimmickry. Classes used to be places where serious learning took place. No more. Under block scheduling, they have become little more than glorified playtime periods. Classes used to consist of core subject material being communicated to students by individuals rich in knowledge and experience. Now, teachers are no longer teachers, but merely guides, glorified babysitters, if you will. Under block scheduling, the students are now in groups trying to discover facts that used to be communicated instantly when teachers actually taught. It's obvious that this format wastes valuable class time, and that doesn't include the time students waste by talking, singing, and becoming restless all around as a result of the lengthened class periods. This letter articulates the concerns some teachers, parents, and even students have about block scheduling, where class periods last 80 to 100 minutes and only four classes are held each day. This type of schedule became popular in middle and high schools in the 1990s as an alternative to the traditional schedule, where students attend the same six to eight classes, 45 to 50 minutes each every day. The idea behind the change was that with less transition time between classes, fewer instructional minutes would be wasted, and the kinds of behavior issues and bullying that can crop up during class transitions would also be cut down. On top of that, having extended blocks of time would give teachers the opportunity to dive more deeply into their content. And in many cases, schools have been successful with block scheduling. They've even found solutions for some of the problems it presents, like offering shorter periods for classes like math and band, where consistent daily practice is more important. But one issue with block scheduling seems to persist. A problem that is highlighted in that letter I read. A problem that is still voiced by teachers and students today. The ineffective use of the longer block of instructional time. So that's what we're gonna focus on today. We'll start by looking at the mindset that causes a lot of block scheduling's biggest problems Then we'll quickly review some best practices for teaching in the block. And finally, I'll walk you through five specific structures you can choose from to plan solid, interesting instruction for an extended class period, the kind of teaching that will make those 90 minutes fly by. Before we get started, I would like to thank Raymond Geddes for sponsoring this episode. For over 90 years, this third generation family owned business has been making fun and affordable school supplies, stationery, and toys that students love. Whether you're looking for merchandise for your student run store, new fundraising ideas, or awesome rewards for your classroom treasure chest, Raymond Geddes has what you need from school supplies, fidgets, scented pens, non candy Halloween treats, and much more. Visit cultofpedagogy.com slash Geddes, G E D D E S and use code COP20 when you check out to get free shipping and 20% off your first order. I also want to thank you deeply for the reviews you've left for this podcast on iTunes. I absolutely love to read these and every new review gives new listeners more reasons to come check out the show. So if you like what I'm doing here and you think other teachers would like it too, head over to iTunes and leave a review. Thanks. Okay. So let's dig into this. Let's start by looking at one of the main sources of trouble when it comes to block schedules. We're calling this a lecture as teaching mindset. Now, some of the challenges associated with block scheduling boil down to simple logistics, like needing more time for AP courses. And these issues can often be solved with creative scheduling tweaks. But the rest of it 
the criticisms lobbed at block scheduling and the problems that can crop up with it can almost all be traced back to one mindset, a single, strong, pervasive belief about teaching, and that mindset is this, teaching equals lecture. This mindset, the belief that lecture is the only real way to teach, causes all kinds of trouble in block scheduling. Let's go back to that math teacher who described the extended classes in block scheduling as glorified play periods in his letter. One likely reason he felt that way was because he saw his coworkers doing something besides straight up lecturing. Here's a line from his letter again, where he longs for the good old days of traditional scheduling. Quote, classes used to consist of core subject material being communicated to students by individuals rich in knowledge and experience. What could he possibly mean besides lecture? In this teacher's mind, Anything that isn't lecture couldn't possibly be serious learning. And therefore, all the other non-lecture-based activities he observed in his colleagues' classrooms were a waste of time. And to an extent, he may have a point, but bear with me. (laughs) We don't know what was going on in his colleagues' classrooms. Maybe the other teachers were using some highly effective techniques that he was just unfamiliar with. Or maybe if his school was like some who don't invest enough in training teachers in different methodologies, they really were just screwing around. Because if teachers don't have a well-rounded repertoire of instructional strategies, methods that they know are effective, they will only use lecture to teach. And that gives them one of two choices. The first choice is to lecture for the full 90 minutes, which bores students to tears can lead to behavior problems, and ultimately has a negative return since student attention spans can't be sustained for longer than about 15 minutes at a time. So in this case, you're covering a lot of material, but students aren't learning it. The other choice, if lecture is your only option, is to lecture for half the period, then give students the second half for homework time or busy time or free time. This is also ineffective because that means students are actually learning only half the material over the course of a semester or year. This is typically the reason why some teachers object to block scheduling. They say they can't get through as much material. But if these teachers knew more strategies, the remaining time in every class period could be used for instruction that would actually hit more learning targets. So this belief that teaching equals lecture is really the source of a whole lot of problems. So let's take a look at some best practices when teaching on a block schedule. And by teaching on a block schedule, what I really mean is teaching an extended class period. I'm not talking about all the different types of block configurations. That would be a topic for a different time. So some general best practices whether you're getting started now in block scheduling or you've been doing it for a while and it's not working, this would be something to check yourself on. The first one, as you may have guessed, is do not rely solely on lecture. This advice comes from every teacher I've talked to who's been successful with block scheduling and every piece of research I've read about successful block teaching. And uh, in the blog post associated with this podcast, uh, I link to just one article that's a really good review of the research and practices uh, by somebody named J. Allen Queen. Uh, To find that, to find all of the resources associated with this episode, just go to cultopedagogy.com, click on podcast, and then just click on episode 75, and you'll be taken to a blog post post with a ton of links to a lot of the resources I'm going to talk about. So again, The first best practice is to not rely solely on lecture. Although I do believe that a brief dynamic lecture every now and then is an efficient way to deliver instruction, it doesn't need to be abandoned entirely. Teachers who lean too heavily on it are doomed to failure in a longer class period. So instead use a variety of instructional strategies, many of which we will get to in a little while. Another best practice for block scheduling is to switch activities every 15 to 20 minutes. Students get restless when they're required to sit still or do the same thing for long periods of time. 
So unless they're working on a task that will truly engage them for a full hour, and we will get to some of those in a few minutes, look at your class period as a series of 15 to 20 minute chunks of time and switch activities on a regular basis. Another best practice is to over plan. If you've ever finished your planned activities in a 50 minute period and found yourself with that 10 awkward minutes to kill, imagine how much worse it is when you have 30 awkward minutes to kill. So plan for the essential activities, but also build in some extras that would be nice to get to, but aren't essential. I talked to a high school history teacher named Megan Brockway. Actually, I don't even know if it's Megan or Megan spelled M-E-A, but she is in Greencastle, Pennsylvania, and she uh, loves block scheduling. And here is her advice. She says, block scheduling requires planning for more than you can accomplish and then continually readjusting based on student needs. Now, this readjustment may vary from student to student and class to class. And here's what Megan says. If I have a class that is tremendously behind, then it is a matter of looking at the extras and either cutting those out completely to get to the content needed, or if it's a class that's up for a challenge, then I give them extended time to complete it on their own. If this kind of flexibility is really necessary in block scheduling, but you can't be that flexible unless you have more than enough activities planned for the time that you have allowed. The last bit of advice in terms of best practices in general is to use a smart pacing guide. One of the challenges of block scheduling is fitting in all of the content you might be used to teaching on a daily schedule. Pacing guides, which are used to map out when you will address each learning target or standard throughout the year or semester, are essential to make sure you use class time wisely. But These usually value coverage over actual learning, just getting through lots and lots of material, and they don't really take into account the variability in uh, different students' um, pacing. So the late educator Grant Wiggins, and he's one of the authors of Understanding by Design. If you've ever heard of backward design, a lot of that can be traced right back to Grant Wiggins. Um, He has always offered incredibly insightful ideas on authentic learning, and in the post I'm going to link to Um, a post that he wrote about designing pacing guides, uh, but he offers a a twist on them um, so that they help teachers hit the most essential standards, but also build in time for reteaching and extension when necessary. So you're going to get a link to that in the post, but in case you don't get around to it, I'll quickly summarize what this guide looks like. It looks a lot like a regular pacing guide, you know, with different standards assigned to different months or weeks over the school year, but The most essential standards are highlighted or starred so that when teachers find themselves needing more time on an essential standard, they give themselves permission to skip over some of the non-essential ones, the ones that are not starred. This builds in flexibility that honors the unpredictable way that students learn. So those are just some general principles to keep in mind in terms of working with the block schedule. The next thing we're going to look at are five structures for teaching in the block, five different ways you can break up a 90-minute class period so you build in variety and keep students engaged. Before we do that, though, I'm going to take a quick break to tell you about my other sponsor, Kids Discover Online. They are doing some really cool stuff to drive inquiry-based learning. Kids Discover Online is a platform that offers a huge library of award-winning nonfiction science and social studies materials and units for elementary and middle school learners. Each unit is a full lesson on subjects like the Constitution, ecology, and ancient China. They also have this cool feature called Discover Mode. It's a visual concept map that shows how units like ancient Egypt and simple machines are connected. It's really visual and interactive, and it's just fun to play around with. Kids Discover Online also offers multiple reading levels, an assessment builder, and single sign-on with Google and Clever. You can get started for free. Just go to cultofpedagogy.com slash kidsdiscover, all one word, and check it out. Okay. So let's take a look at these five ways to break up a block class period. You can mix and match these structures over the course of a marking period, and I would recommend that. If you you hear these different structures and say, oh, I really like that one, and then you do that same one every time, your students are going to get bored with that one. So I would recommend that you 
you know, try to use all of these at, at different times. Okay, and when I refer to these two, I'm pretty much always going to refer to things as a 90-minute period, even though I realize some of you teach a 100-minute period, some of you are doing some, you know, 84 minutes or something, but 90 is just an, a nice, easy number to, to use that to. So make your own adjustments, obviously. Okay, the first structure I am calling the classic. This would look the most like a typical lesson, except you would have time to do it right and include all the bells and whistles that we know a good lesson should have. So the first 10 minutes or so would be an engaging anticipatory set to pique students' interest, build relevance, bring concepts out of long-term memory, or just set the stage for learning. This is a step we often skip over when we're pressed for time. For ideas on a good anticipatory set, um, I'm linking in the post to uh, a post I wrote about anticipatory sets and then another link on how to approach your teaching like a master chef. And this is an interview I did with two math teachers, but the way they look at introducing a lesson is just incredible. Some of the ideas that they come up with. And if you prefer to listen by podcast, uh, I interviewed them. John Stevens and Matt Vaudry. This is episode 53, How to Approach Your Teaching Like a Master Chef. They just have these incredible ideas for really piquing students' interest at the beginning of a lesson. So that would be the first 10 to 15 minutes of class. The next 15 to 20 would be some kind of direct instruction where the teacher delivers the day's lesson through maybe a lecture, which in small doses is okay, doing a demonstration, showing a video, having students read through some kind of text, or even doing like an interactive online lesson. But this is sort of students' first exposure to whatever content they're supposed to learn that day. The next 30 minutes or so would be student application of the content. This might take the form of individual practice, um, something called reciprocal learning, which I am linking to a post where I show you how to do that. This is where students um, work together on something, but one student has the answers to the other students' exercises and vice versa, so they sort of coach each other. It's fantastic. Or some other kind of group work. So start with an anticipatory step, do some direct instruction, do student application. Then the next 15 or 20 minutes would be some sort of an assessment of the content or skill. And then maybe that would be followed by a little bit of reteaching to those who need it or an extension activity for students who met the standard. And then finally, the last five to 10 minutes of class would be a reflection or some other kind of wrap up where the value of the lesson is reinforced. And I don't know about you, but I've been told forever that, you know, reflecting at the end of a lesson is really important for students to retain that learning that they just did. And I'm, I also don't know about you, but I almost always ran out of time before I ever got to that. So again, in block schedule, you have the luxury of really doing all these pieces correctly. So Whitney Schultz, who teaches 80-minute blocks of English at a high school in Baltimore, Maryland, uses this kind of structure on most days, mixing up the activities within each of those segments. This is what she says. That 10 to 15-minute review and 10 to 15-minute introduction might instead be a 20 to 30-minute quiz followed by self-grading, or in my AP class, it might be 20 to 30 minutes of daily AP practice followed by 40 to 50 minutes of text discussion and analysis. What she says is, I've found it's easier to fill 80 minutes than to try to trim down what I actually cover each day. So she's really, you know, still doing a pretty traditional lesson, but she's gotten used to that 80 minutes and really filling it with high quality stuff instead of trying to rush it all into a 50 minute class. So that's the classic. That's just taking a really traditional lesson format and really stretching the parts out so that you really are settling into each one and doing them all fully. The next structure of the five, number two, is called the workshop. In this structure, students would spend the majority of time working on their own projects. The class period might start out with a brief, like 10 minute mini lesson, and that could be related to something that students are working on in the projects. And it would ideally end with some kind of a wrap up, a sharing, or a reflection time. Again, maybe five to 10 minutes at the end. But at least a full hour in the middle would be spent working independently or in groups on a long-term hands-on project. Meanwhile, the teacher would circulate, conferencing individually with students as needed, or even using an appointment system like the one used at the Apollo School. 
Now, the Apollo School, uh, these are this is a set of teachers that I interviewed in episode 62. This is an incredible four-hour block of time that is shared by a language arts, uh, social studies, and art teacher. And this is also in Pennsylvania. And they, so you think that you're doing block scheduling. They're doing this huge chunk of time. And the way that they set up conferences is through um, a, an online scheduling system. Students just um, sign up for 15-minute appointments with uh, one of the three teachers if they need to conference on something. So that would be another way to to work out those um, student teacher conferences. So here are some things that could be done in the workshop structure. In an English language arts class, this could be independent writing or reading or a mixture of both, depending on what each student happens to be working on at the time. If you're running a self-paced math class or you're delivering instruction through hyperdocs or playlists, and we've talked about all of these on the podcast too, which I link to in this, you know, in this document, where students work at their own pace through a series of lessons. Then during the hour, students would just get started from wherever they are in the materials, and then they would just continue working wherever they are. Finally, in any class that has implemented Genius Hour, this time could be devoted to research, writing, or working on presentations for that project. And Genius Hour is something we have also talked about a lot on the podcast. More recently, we've talked about it in episode 55. So we've got the classic, the workshop. The next structure is the lab. One big focused activity takes up most of the class period in this structure. Similar to the workshop, except everybody is doing the same thing this time. Whereas in the workshop, everyone's sort of working on their own thing. In the lab, it's one task that everyone is doing. So similar to the workshop, class might start with some kind of an introduction. It might end with a reflection or a wrap up, but at least an hour is set aside for an activity where the whole class digs into a single meaty task. In this case, the task itself is designed to be active and engaging. So the rule about switching every 15 to 20 minutes is waived this time. The big activity could be any of the following. It could be a, a simulation or a role play, which can be incredibly useful in helping students understand complex social studies or science concepts. It could be a debate, a Socratic seminar, or some other long-form discussion strategy. It could be a project-based learning activity. It could be a virtual field trip, which Skype offers, and they are amazing, and I've put a link to that also in this post. I can't even explain how amazing these are, but when I saw what you can do with a Skype virtual field trip, it's basically you and your class get on Skype and you talk to an expert anywhere in the world and they sort of show you a place or thing. It's hard to explain. Um, the, one, the one that they show in the example is the grandson of Jacques Cousteau doing an underwater dive through Skype. So, you know, your kids can go underwater with Jacques Cousteau's grandson. Um, other activities for the lab format would be yeah, something like a jigsaw or another cooperative learning activity. It could be an actual lab. If you're a science teacher, it could just be a lab. Um, and then the last idea is sketch noting. This idea comes from Jana Mayuri. And Jana, I apologize if I am butchering your last name. I never asked you how to pronounce it. Jana is a middle school English teacher in Oakland, California, who will occasionally set aside a whole class period for students to create sketch notes on a given topic. And in case you don't know what sketch notes are, they're those really interesting, almost cartoon looking, um, almost like a collage with notes and arrows pointing to different sections. And uh, it's a really visual way of taking notes. So here's how she describes it. She says it starts with a 10 minute rapid fire warm up, followed by a kind of, okay, show me everything you know about commercial fish depletion in a sketch note in the next 90 minutes. And then in the next class, we do two concentric circles and everyone gets two minutes to present their sketch. They point out three vital facts, the most unique or compelling thought and one artistic accomplishment or challenge. She says the movement and the art are engaging and thought provoking. So I, I thought this was such a neat idea because I think to do really good sketch notes, you would need that extended chunk of time. Um, and in the post, I'm linking to uh, a blog post over on Vicki Davis's Cool Cat Teacher website, which is a really comprehensive post on getting started on sketch noting, if that sounds like something you'd like to do. Okay, so the three structures we've looked at so far are the classic, the workshop, the lab, and then the next one is the performance. 
At the end of a learning cycle, students should ideally have some kind of final product to share with peers or even outside visitors. A 90-minute block class would be ideal for sharing and celebrating this student work. This performance could take many forms. They could be student speeches, a student film festival, a gallery of physical or digital products. Uh, this could be you know, a performance of skits. This could be a reading of poetry or short stories or other uh, kinds of writing that students have done. Really lots and lots of possibilities. So that's the uh, fourth structure. And then the last one I'm just calling the variety pack. <laughs> On some days, you might opt to just give students a fast-paced mixture of activities. Some that might review previously learned content, some that introduce new stuff, others that do a bit of drill and practice, and even some that are just for fun and enrichment. These could be handled in a station rotation model, they could be done with student-selected learning centers, or you could just march the class through a series of small activities together. So here are just a couple of possible activities you could include in this kind of a variety pack day. You could do any kind of skills practice, flashcard work, retrieval practice, which is a really important concept where students, you know, um, call things into uh, their, from their long-term memory. And we talked about that in episode 58, Six Powerful Learning Strategies You Must Share with Students. Uh, you could watch a short video clip, play a short audio clip. Students could do independent reading. They could do journal writing. You could have a short philosophical chairs debate or some other kind of a brief, you know, uh, discussion strategy. You could do a short read aloud from a book that you're reading together as a class. Uh, another activity could involve small group work and some individual work with the teacher. And you could also just incorporate games like you see on Kahoot or Quizzes or even a non-tech game that I've taught about called Crumple and Shoot, which I'm providing a link to also. So whether you're brand new to block scheduling or you've already been doing it for years, I hope you've found at least one new idea here to help you make the most of that extended class period and never again be accused of running a glorified playtime period. For links to all the resources mentioned in this episode, visit cultofpedagogy.com slash pod and click on episode 75. To get weekly updates on all my newest blog posts, podcast episodes, and products, sign up for my mailing list at cultofpedagogy.com slash subscribe. Thanks so much for listening and have a great day. This podcast is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. To learn more, visit edupodcastnetwork.com.